CB might be. It's December 6th. It's the endo meeting. Leo's got questions and then Aaron's got a demo. Yep, sure. So I'll link the pull request in chat. It's just a draft at the moment. So if I share my screen. Cool. So I've been working on a version of CES that works for Hermes on Android. Um, I've made a few modifications so far and um, yeah, just had some questions on how essential some of those might be and if you had any thoughts. So um, yeah, the first part is, um, so if I just scroll down or look here. Um, so from removing a few async await parts, um, we got bundling working on Android. So then yeah, it bundles fine and it builds fine. So those modifications were fine. But then, um, yeah, I'll go to the more, the other modifications I had to do. So if I get us, uh, uh, getting rid of async await simply mean just transforming the coding style to using promises directly. Um, or so be synchronous. So just from remo removing the keywords initially. Um, so if I just go. So yeah, um, async function, so it was done here. I'll go to the first instance where it was done. Do, do, do. Cool, so yeah, this was the first error that was throwing on Hermes. It was saying, um, um, I wrote it down here, async functions are not supported, as we know um, in the Hermes language at the moment. So uh, I initially just removed the async keyword uh, from here and removed a few other await parts. So looking at this part here, um, yeah, how, how, um, what might these parts affect um, <laughs> with this? The um, import hook and return a promise. We could. So Z yes, ZB was mentioning that we might be able to get rid of these parts entirely. Um, to... Yeah, a bit of context. We only want lockdown. And so we don't need any of the compartment mechanics. I see. Okay. So the prop, yeah. So, uh, so the answer to this question is not, so we can't return, we can't remove async await from the compartment mechanisms. Um, okay. or at least we can't, mm. We could we could rewrite them in terms of promises directly instead, in order to avoid using the async await keyword. Anything that you use as async await can be can be refactored to not use async await. Um, can that you is... transpile and use regenerator runtime and stuff instead? So regenerator runtime has known issues with Cess. Mm. Um, Mm. And those known issues are about discovery of async gener async function prototypes. So we previously uh, we talked need about to having... remove async function prototypes discovery anyway because they don't exist in Hermes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so on one hand, I'm open to refactoring this so that syntactically Cess does not use async await and also has a mode flag, or as we discussed in the past, I solemnly swear async await does not exist in this runtime. Yeah. Um, which uh, you... I don't think that's doable. <clears throat> I mean, refactoring is uh, doable, but uh, not sure if worth it, uh, because we can have a simple transform that uh, gets rid of all uh, async keywords and uh, as long as it doesn't have to work uh, the compartment code will not crash anything and uh, if we want um, if we if we want Hermes not to complain um, there's probably no way for us to optionally get the async function prototypes uh, because it's going to like the the filter that checks for async is quite primitive 
not as primitive as our checking for uh, import or HTML comments, but uh, I, I'm thinking very close to that. Oh, I see. So even if uh, the code that contains an async function never runs, uh, Hermes is complaining anyway and refusing to run the code. Mm -hmm. Right. So my yeah, idea yeah. was to figure out everything we, uh, we want to remove is safe to remove for lockdown to still function correctly. Uh, and then we create a code mod uh, that's going to take original SAS and adapt it to no async environments. There is another option. Um... And that is, there are a number of converging reasons to take CES and then create layers of it that can be selectively merged. And the compartment shim could be made optional so that you can just build your own CES from CES parts. That just requires exposing the individual layers and it happens to be the case that I have a pull request open that does that. Um, that does that, but for different reasons. The reason being that we need to get CES to be... We need a different version of CES for XS going forward at some point in order to take advantage of the underlying, compart uh, the underlying native compartment implementation. Um, so yeah, that is a design direction. Okay, that sounds promising. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I think the other one was async function generators were unsupported as well. So if I just find that part, um, so async functions. Oh yeah, this was the other part. Yeah, async generator function instance. Yeah. So re yeah, removing async from this part as well. Yeah. To be clear, I'm we. We can't upstream that change. Um, yep. If you're talking about doing a transform, you definitely can. Yeah, transform. Um, the web and yeah, assuming that assuming that stuff never actually executes, <laughs> never is actually needed to perform its duties, then okay, yeah, you might have a sound. Sure. Says, I'm not sure. And then. Sure. Um, there were a few other parts as well. So the first one was being um, the asserting direct to eval because Hermes. So her Hermes have so eval is not supported, but there's a non-standard version of eval which causes problems. So that's the reason for um, yeah, commenting out this part to um, yeah, it has a there... global eval that's a function, but it doesn't seem to do anything reasonable. Placeholder, possibly. Interesting. And you can't delete it? What happens if you delete it before running CES? Uh, we didn't try that yet. Um, um, yeah, I, I, I assume that CES breaks still, but um, I, think, I think that we could, in good conscience, make changes to CES where if eval is not present, it behaves, assuming eval is not present. Okay, that would be good. Um, oh yeah, here yeah here are the final um, parts summarized. So um, was having issues with um, tame regexp constructor, tame symbol constructor, complete prototypes, and white li whitelist intrinsics. Mm -hmm. So um, starting with. Uh, taming regexp. So this is what we are running into. We are running into um, this error thrown by Cess. Um, I can jump to it. Uh, you would need to increase the font. I don't think anyone was able to read it. Uh, yeah, sure. Unless they have a very big screen. Oh yeah, this looks better. So yeah, hitting this point um, when running Hermes. So um, yeah, how how essential would is is this um is it worth looking further into um or can it simply be 
skipped, possibly. Uh, so, um, this is safe that we, so in an in environment, in so essentially, we throw an error in any environment in which symbol dot species does not yet exist. Mm -hmm. um, Why is that uh, important for lockdown? I don't know. That one I don't know. I would recommend yes. opening an issue and tagging Mark. Okay. Because we want to know what we're risking if we skip that part. Yeah, it might be. Uh, I suggest that you open an issue proposing that CES be modified such that in the absence of the existence of symbol species that we just omit it from the intrinsics and move on with our lives. Um, <laughs> and that will give us a reason to document why <laughs> either to either assent or document sure um so and then number two um tame symbol constructor so this is not an error thrown by cess but um it ends up being thrown by react native polyfills fatal error property is not configurable so best part to do is probably look at the code itself um oh yeah so our question was about the oh, yeah. this is the reason the reason being that we yeah yeah uh yeah what does this accomplish you <laughs> might i don't get that part you um you might need to update your underlying version because i think that this has changed since you started working on that uh i know that we made a change in CES that separated the symbol object that is left in global scope of the start compartment from the symbol object that is share a shared intrinsic. The shared intrinsic is frozen, which would make it impossible for a polyfill to add any symbol dot properties. And if you're running a polyfill, um, are you running the polyfill before or after CES? uh after yeah that i think that that's the heart of the problem and that if you update that we probably have already solved this problem for you uh, i think the error was thrown from where uh, the defined properties call is happening mm -hmm. on the shared symbol but that mm -hmm. would mean the shared symbol already had a non-configurable property that we were trying to replace with a configurable one. Oh. Is that even possible? Huh. So, well, no, this, this does look like it's making the distinction between the shared symbol and the original symbol, but is it I, the thing that changed is that we're no longer putting the shared symbol object in global scope of the start compartment if memory serves and my memory has been terrible for baby reasons um, so check anything I say okay. um, tame symbol oh yeah so in our initial version of modifying this was an issue but um, I'm not having problems with get anonymous intrinsics anymore so this this part seems fine but yeah before was getting conflicting definitions of in a async function but it's not happening anymore um so yeah the last couple um parts probably important um very important are complete prototypes so um what was hermes oh yeah another cess error that um is we're reaching lockdown the prototype property is not whitelisted so um yeah That's we're <laughs> Yeah, so I think that's... what is Hermes doing that we do not understand? Yeah, so and then yeah, I may have tried skipping this part, and there may have been more. I think I think it was just um, lockdown dot prototype, but I know that with whitelisting intrinsics, um, yeah, this was the start of many other things. But yeah, just to focus on complete prototypes, um, yeah, um. It might be safe to just add a permit for the prototype object. I don't know why that's a problem, though. Mm. Mm. Uh, 
Okay. And um, moving on to whitelist intrinsics. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So yeah, the intrinsic um, that's uh, throwing a cess error is, is infinite. Uh, and then after skipping this, there were many other parts, but um, so if we just skip to where in the code, this is uh, unexpected entrance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the part we're reaching. So, oh, okay, it's in within visit prototype. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the this is the permits visitor. Mm -hmm. um, There's yeah many more. Yeah, so it's finding Dunder Proto objects in places it's not expecting to. That's probably because Dunder Proto is expected to exist on object.prototype and nowhere else. So it is weird. It would be weird that Hermes is adding Dunder Protos to intrinsics that should not have them. Like, is finite? Huh. I mean, yeah, it, it's finite. Uh, I, I, so I'd expect... Is, so does that mean the pro, the Dunder Proto is defined on is pro is finite as opposed to inherited from function prototype and then object prototype? That's my. Mm. I mean, so we're visiting prototype unexpected intrinsic. Oh, we're not it's using doc lookup, so it's going up the prototype chain. Yeah, but it's using get prototype up. the The Dunder prototype is a uh, red herring. Um, mm. That's just notational for mm -hmm. the error message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, I can create an issue for this and um yeah, flag up the other ones. There was yeah, there was a bunch of them, but I just noted down them yeah, the first part. Okay. It, it's just strange to me, I think, that this is um that yeah, this is this is different between Hermes and other JS runtimes. Um yeah. let me I'm 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 reading one moment. Sure. Uh, I think this happens when some of the some of the things that are supposed to be natively implemented are actually implemented in JavaScript and yeah. they end up with a prototype pointing yeah, to I, an I, object. I think the same as well. Um like to to actually override the to string to return a uh, native implementation or native code or something like that, as opposed to show the internals of the function. Yeah, there's a, that that's another thing as well. There is a, uh, we have a, a mark native function, func function laying around in CES for that purpose uh, that we use with, within CES to emulate native behavior with a fake function prototype. Well, with, a, with fake functions. Yeah, um, yeah, I suspect that you're right. I suspect also, that this could be that the permitting mechanism could be refactored such that it allows for these additional prototype objects as long as they correspond and then they get hardened, correspond to what we would expect there, and then hardened. Like is Cess is in a position where it tolerates the existence of properties that it doesn't exist and then just deletes them. Um you can't you can't delete a prototype. Mm -hmm. Well, in any case, this is a conversation that we probably should have with Mark present because this is beyond me. Um, okay, sure. Yeah, th yeah. This was the last um, modification. Yeah, whitelist intrinsic. Yeah, I recommend um, maybe making a an omnibus issue for each of these things, and then we can discuss them. Sure. Okay. Then, yeah. Um, with so that. I'm uh, sorry, just, just before we move on, just to clarify uh, the eval issue, um, was it was it um, a problem with direct eval or not? Because I did find an issue from April 3rd that you guys opened. Um, 
on Hermes, right? So um, I'm not sure if the problem changed from that issue or uh, is it still the same? So if eval is officially unsupported, uh, the thing is the global name eval exists. Like if you uh, do type off eval, uh, you'll get function. If you try to uh, concat eval with a string, you get uh, the string saying native function. So something's there. It just doesn't seem to do anything reasonable. And when Cess is trying to uh, measure the behavior of eval, it's not getting the right results. And it's assuming that it's a broken eval and it's doing that correctly. Yeah, I think that tracks because the only mention I found on their site is it's used for their REPL. Um, so they haven't really implemented the conforming uh, behavior, I guess. Um, so they have a non-conformant partial implementation of eval. Right, looks like a duck, right? I see. Maybe they should have given it a different name. <laughs> well, it looks like a duck. <laughs> Yeah. All right. With that, um, I want to give Aaron the floor. Pulling myself out of the rabbit hole of Hermes issue tree. Um, okay, cool. Um, I have another demo. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Can you see my screen? It should be all big and zoomed. Good, cool. So today I will be demonstrating uh, my take on the familiar chat UI. So this is the UI for, or a UI for the endo daemon. Um, and I'm going to be sort of demonstrating a social multi-user mode. Um, this is uh, implemented through guests, which are kind of like profiles. So we don't actually have like networking across multiple endo daemons yet. So I'm just sort of uh, modeling it with what we have so far. Uh, but on the left hand side, we have the UI for host and on the right hand side, we have another user Alice um, host has a host of objects uh -huh, and Alice has none on the right. Um, and what this is, is a chat program. So we can go down here and we can say hi Alice and then Alice will see the message over here. Um, and it works much like you would expect chat to work. Um, uh, I guess uh, I'll explain these objects here. So host has a bunch of things. Um, happens to have uh, a couple of guests here. These are like profiles. Um, has a bunch of cards. This is from my previous demo. And these are all objects. Um, and then we have a couple apps. Familiar chat. That is this app that we're using right now. We've got the one KCE game that I demonstrated previously. Um, and then we have another profile down here. Um, and so, yeah, we can, the apps have this special option to open the app. So let's go ahead and open the game. So this is the game from last time. It should look familiar. Uh, we can start making a deck and we can add some cards to it. Um, but not just that, we can now say, um, let's play a game. Um, and you can reference uh, pet names right here in your chat and i i'm i must see i i uh i didn't have to do all this all all this was already built into the pet daemon by chris and so i'm just uh added it to the ui um in a few different ways okay so let's uh at, let's send this game let's send this app to alice um i and we started uh, a deck under uh, the guest deck. And let's also send Alice uh, a card. I bet Alice would like card deja vu. Okay. So on the right-hand side, you can see um, that one, Alice doesn't have anything in her inventory yet. And, and two, these references on the right-hand side in the message all start with a question mark. This is because um, they are 
these messages include references to uh, these objects, um, but they don't appear in Alice's inventory. Uh, but if we take a look at them, we, we can see some controls here. We have this, this card deja vu. It is an object um, and we can, you know, adopt it under some different name or we can keep that default name. And so when I press this, it will add it to our inventory. And similarly for deck, we have an opportunity to call it something else. Um, but we'll just leave it like this for now. So now we have three things in our inventory. Also, we have the game. Now the game is a little different because it's an app. And so we can install app. Um, and what that will do is it'll, the app contains like an app bundle and then it's also associated with uh, a profile. Um, and what this will do is it'll add the game with our profile here. Now we probably, you know, that the profile implies having access to all our inventory. And so normally you'd probably want to install it with some empty profile, then it would ask you for the powers it needs. Uh, but for the sake of this demo, I'm just giving it the, the power that the user has. So I'm going to go ahead and install the app. And so now that we've installed this app, uh, we can open it up and it's reading from our, um, our pet name list. And so it sees the deck that we got and um, also the card that we got. So now we can start contributing cards to this deck as well. Um, and so back on host, host sees the cards that Alice added. Um, and uh, now and can initiate starting the game. Um, so now we have, if we go back over here to the inventory of the host, we see that we now have a game and we can say, to Alice, hey, start of the game, let's play. Um, and Alice sees a message. Alice can adopt the game. And when she goes back to her game, it loads the game. Um, now, the I didn't mod for this demo, I did not modify the game, so it's still built as like hot seat multiplayer, and so you're not going to see a proper multiplayer experience, but it you know kind of works as four you can play play the game uh as before but the main thing i wanted to highlight was how you can um, both transfer objects uh easily by just sending a message and referencing it in there uh, as well as transferring applications that consume those objects um and yeah that was the demo thanks uh i guess we can do q a now uh can we see for for just the pleasure of seeing it happen, uh, restarting the whole thing and the referen references being reconstructed? Ah, yeah. So for uh, yeah, so we're going to simulate a restart of the computer. Uh, that's the right command. I always confuse restart and reset, which erases everything. Um, okay, that looks good. Um, so now I'm going to reload this. That, so our inbox looks the same. I'm going to reload the game. The game looks the same. And uh, uh, oh, yeah, oh, we're logged in as Alice over here. Oh, interesting. We lost chat history. Um, I'm not sure why we lost chat history, but um, we no retained. Problem. There's no message persistent in mailboxes yet. Oh. Uh, we uh, persisted our inventory, and the game works for Alice as well. Um, really subtle and not something I can zoom, um, but if you notice, the URL for these applications are different um, because they uh, entrain, they're associated with different powers. Um, uh, this one is being associated with Alice and this one being associated with the host. Oh, um, one thing that I forgot to mention that is really important is this, uh, this was design was largely based on the presentation uh, from the Sprightly project um, on their, on their like chat app. Um, but this very little, um, most of this was ready to go out of the box in the pet name demon and mostly involved uh, just building the UI and then adding a couple things like exposing type information of objects. Um, so pretty much out of the box with pet demon, which is really nice.
So how does the how does Alice know that Game One KCE is an app? Yeah, so it is indicated in so there's behind the scenes in in the pet name daemon there's different kinds of formulas and those formulas have uh internal types um and that's like is it a profile is it a uh data blob is it an app bundle um and uh that internal type is exposed to the ui um, and a app or web bundle is one one internal type. Um, we haven't oh, okay. really. So what's called a weblet or something is an app. Chris? Yes. Is that yeah. Called a, well, the, the internal type is is web bundle. Okay. Uh, that's what the string is inside of Endodaemon. And then unsafe means it was loaded with unsafe. Yeah, that that is not an actual requirement to produce this sort of demo, um, but the way of I was being lazy. The short answer is I was being sure. lazy. Sure, but it means that it's running unconfined, right? I'm not actually sure what kind of safety it refers to. Okay. Yeah. I... yeah then safety isn't. Um... Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the formula. The formula is, um, un yeah, is an unsafe bundle, and unsafe in this case means that it's not, um, that 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 it that it's running off of the file system and uh and that it's running in pure node. It's not confined. So this yeah, is. Yeah, I a we should start using the word un unconfined there because it, it's, you know it's it's running the same node that everybody is same kind of code that everybody else uses. <laughs> It's not some yeah. scary thing. <laughs> yeah, it's unsafe. Just, you know, like you're used to. Yeah, this is the yeah this is the level of safety that you have accepted tacitly whenever right. you <laughs> have installed something. <laughs> the, it's not unsafe so much as that. Yeah, it's unsafe, but <laughs> anyway, but, unconfined is kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. But it, uh, again, that was just because I the bundling functionality was not exposed to the web browser as neatly and so it was easier to just import it without bundling um, but that would be trivial awesome. to fix yeah um, i had something that should uh, go ahead uh, sorry uh when you say profile what are you referring to yes um so I, may i i, I think yeah. that uh but so Aaron was synthesizing the the sprightly demo, and then the sprightly demo there is an entity called a profile, and what we discovered was that the um, what I had called hosts and guests were kinds of profile. Yeah, and one thing that they have is like uh, they have their own set of pet names, they have their own inbox for receiving messages um and so uh right now we're looking at the profile for host here we're looking at the profile for alice on the right hand side um and similarly we could look at the profile for the guest for the game and you can see it it's internal pet name references that it has saved or for right. the deck has a uh, pet names for all the cards that have been added to the deck. Yeah, I was and, kind of struggling to internalize this, this this command line objects for, you know, act as this person or act as that person. I, I guess these guests are sort of computing you're likely to do on behalf of other parties. Uh yeah, that would be fair. There there are there are two uses. If you're if you're creating multiple host objects, those are what I think correspond most closely to profiles. The guest objects are were like agents of third parties. Okay. I have and, for the sake of this demo, I've made the guests really powerful, so they don't they're not that different from a host at this point on on my setup, but that's not merged. Um but uh so, yeah, I think the, the main thing is being able to hold uh pet names and receive messages. And so like when I um it's not entirely set up that way but when you like you know 
when we set up the game, um, uh, we are, when do we do this? Or I think the clear example is the deck. Okay, so the deck, you know, of course it's keeping track of its cards. And then whenever I send a card to the, to the deck, um, you know, in the, in, I'm using the UI to add cards to the deck, but what's happening behind the scenes is equivalent to saying card. Uh, and here I'm going to show, I didn't demo, put this in the demo, but I'm re renaming, uh, I'm referencing a pet name in my message and I'm renaming it. So like it's, the name is going to be different from my name uh, when it appears in the message. And I never can remember which one is on the left and which one is on the right. But um, I think if I do it like this, I think that worked. Okay, so I sent a message to the deck with a reference to a card named card and it, and it received the, the deck, which is this automated agent received the card and added it to its inventory. Um, so I sent it to the guest deck, um, but the deck object, which is running with the guest deck profile is reading from the guest decks. A message inbox and operating on it. I don't know if that was clarifying or more confusing, but that was that's what's happening. <laughs> right. I <got> so it. <laughs> another piece that I'm juggling around in my head is the how um, guests and workers relate. Uh, they are mostly orthogonal. Um, you can, for example, have multiple guests that share a worker. Um, yeah, that hurts my brain. I have to think about it. You, you a, a worker is a process. A, a guest is an inbox and pet name store. So, um, in and 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 they're largely the workers are largely stuffed underneath the the rug, so to speak. Um, like if you create, every time you create a, a caplet, it will implicitly create a new worker for you, and it is anonymous. It, it just won't have a name, um, and that's actually kind of problematic. It needs to be possible to discover the worker that was created on your behalf, um, so that you can manage it. Um, so, uh, and that's just an open problem. The you didn't do that though, right? If I'm you sorry? were to spell. Uh, you can, uh, can you do that currently if you were to spawn yeah. the worker? Story? Yeah, if, if you spawn the worker yourself and give it a name and then use that name when you create the worker, you, you have you have control over that. Say that again. Uh, you can use the endo spawn command to create a worker and then use endo make and then assign a worker to the thing that you made by name. Ah, how many workers are we talking about? Lots. No, no, no. In the, just in the in the sentence you oh, just in, used. in the example, just one. In the example, there's one. Okay. How many guests are we talking about? Just one. Where where did you start talking about a guest? I didn't. Okay. So here's the, here's the full. Uh, endo make dash w worker name dash p guest name and then the uh, dash b for the bundle name. Gives you a capability constructed from that bundle, given those powers, given the powers of that guest in the worker you designated. If you omit the, if you omit the worker, it will create one for you. Uh, okay. If you omit the powers, it will give you least authority, which just rejects any request. Um. And if you omit the dash B, you it will take a file name and construct the bundle on your behalf. Okay. And if you and if you're electing to use any of those implicit behaviors behind the scenes, you don't get pet names for the intermediates. Um, okay. But there. So you so you could do that make with two. You could do make with Alice in worker one, and then make with Bob in worker one. Mm -hmm. You can. Okay. 
So they're yeah, largely think- orthogonal. The, the 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 where where I I think that I'm going to go is to make them slightly less orthogonal, <laughs> and um, I'm thinking that we should add a main worker for each guest. And then just by default, use the same worker for anything that guest, anything made for that guest. Um, that seems like a good default behavior that makes fewer workers and also has the same confinement guarantees that they can, they can mess up their own, the, the, the guest can mess up their own house. Um, but Another question: It's it, in some senses workers come and go, and 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 guests stay around. Although worker pro- formulas kind of stay around too, huh? Yes, worker formulas stay around, um, but all that means is that it will consistently put caplets in the same boxes. It, they they will be they will be placed in the same boxes, and you will be able to look in the same places for their logs. <laughs> right. I was going to, I was going to mention that uh, if you take that approach with the workers, that would eliminate all the fun that comes with having to you know sift through the different worker logs. Oh right, yeah, <laughs> eliminating the fun of, of, of yeah. I I I hope to make sifting through worker logs less fun, and also in the long term less necessary. Uh, Dan this week posted an issue about how uncomfortable and impolite it is to interrogate the logs for the purposes of doing a causal trace because if you run something on the cli with endo run you're going to get every error is going to become a marshalling error and an adventure into the logs to find out where the actual error came from it is possible to build a trace aggregator and endo is i'm excited that the pet demon is in in an excellent position to expose trace ag- to for the pet demon to become a trace aggregator and the workers to be be able to express to expose a trace ag- uh um um uh, an endpoint uh, a cap tp endpoint for um flushing their internal flushing their internal ring buffer for errors um and that would mean that all of the errors could be collected and then and then ascribed to pet named workers um for the purposes of following traces so uh, we we could reconstruct for, on for the benefit of the user at the command line especially a trace that says hey this happened in worker named x and then that happened in worker x because of, of something that happened in worker y etc cetera, etc cetera. the other uh so you this was somewhat inspired by the sprightly work did you have you seen the um Immunity from viruses, safety from geeks bearing gifts demo from 2002, Aaron? The name sounds familiar, but I don't remember the content of the talk. Okay. I think I have seen it, but it has been a really long time. And based off of that, my intuition is that uh, the sprightly presentation was uh, was a rehashing <laughs> of, of a lot of the same ideas. Okay. Yeah, Capdesk was certain. I've never heard it, uh, the, the presentation, but I did hear the phrase geeks bearing gifts. So it's been reused elsewhere. Right. Well, geeks bearing gifts, I don't, I'm not sure that Mark Miller coined that or anything. Um, I mean, Greeks bearing gifts goes back to the Trojan horse and stuff, right? <laughs> it's it's an um it's an irresistible pun. It's right. hard to believe that Mark would be the first. <laughs> but but also awesome if he did. <laughs> anyway, that that was the first talk where I saw with with you know confined agents handing each other games over chats and stuff. Yeah, uh, and Aaron is the chat section. Uh, the this it, it's this it's the same message log, right? You've just added new message types, or have you? You haven't even added new message types. I did not add new message types. Um, it's pretty much the same as you had built it. I added some more information, like type information of what's included inside the package. Yeah, and it's really, really exciting that you've um, put in the logged in as my uh, my uh, 
notion for that was that there would be something similar to your open app button that if you find in your inventory a party like yeah for like guest the alice and bob guest lines that we could have uh and a button there for opening um for for uh, re re recursing i guess on the same no <laughs> the uh, essentially having a way to open up this same app bundle with the other guest as its powers yes um this actually works and i it worked and i didn't expect it to while i was making it so if i you know um uh, i have a couple apps in here there's the game that we were just playing and this is this chat app right here and if i send that to uh, uh alice just build it right looks like just build it right i can install that app and if you notice again, sorry, I can't zoom this up, but this app and this app are exactly the same as in they're hosted with the same powers of the host. We're just viewing this profile of Alice. But now that we've installed, did we install it? Nope. Well, let's install it. No, we did install it. Here it is. Uh -huh. uh, now that we open this, this, it says host at the top, but this is Alice and these are Alice's inventory and um things froze for me does alice have host oh, power i'm sorry i accidentally pressed the pause button when i was trying to get the thing go. out of the way um so um this is running on the right hand side this is running as alice and if she sends a message to i don't know the guest deck hello inanimate object um we will see it here on the left hand side. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So chatting with is uh essentially a filter for which party it, it, it filters the message list based off of the party that you're um the that you, you wish. Correct. To. And also um when you send it sends to that person. Ah, okay. That's what I read it as, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Any other questions? So um, apps are basically data? No. In this particular case, they're, um, they're the treble of the powers object, the bundle that's to be executed when you open it on a web page. And, um, and uh, the URL and, where you can load it from. Yeah. The, it's a... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I've been I've been trying to follow, but it's been my understanding that like do they all fall under the scope of caplets? Okay. That's and then uh, I mean this is how I took it. Like you could have a weblet, a runlet, a worklet, possibly an applet. Would again yeah. be applet. I think the deep, the deeper question that Dan is asking is, is it reasonable to actually send an app to another party? And the answer is no. <laughs> Unless, well, um, no, it's not. Um, the What is reasonable is to send a powers object and a bundle and then ask the, ask them to instantiate the, the, the bun, instantiate the bun or like install it, install the bundle locally with, some set of powers right and um having like sending an app implies that you're sending your own powers with it on it when it goes and that's uh that's not quite right it really uh, one one thing that came from conversing with aaron about this is that i am convinced that we should move that that apps should be an opaque token that is useless to send to another party and that that the three parts the powers that are the powers the bundle and the url should be captured as internal data um to your particular pet demon it would not stretch over the wire so so that's what i have uh more or less set up and when you press install app instead of doing the normal adopt from a package it's calling into a different side of thing it's calling to adopt app inside of the mail which takes the bundle and adds your own powers in and you know i think what we'd really want is that instead of giving it all your powers pretty dangerous it makes its own profile and gives it that profile 
and then the app should request whatever it needs in order to display something. Um, uh, I just didn't architect the game that way originally and didn't have time to change it for this demo. Gotcha. Yeah, that so, makes more sense that, that this pile of data comes in and I say go and then it says, oh, I would like some air, please, and some water and something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the yeah, I did find it a little um, obnoxious working with the profiles explicitly. Like, oh, I got to go create a profile so I can make a thing and have it do basic stuff like storing references. Um, so I kind of want it to be easier to just have implicit profiles or something. And like, I don't. I'm not super interested in seeing them show up in my inventory. I just want like, uh, I just want to create a deck and, and allow that to receive things. And if that means it needs to have a profile on the back end that I'm, uh, then, it's then yeah. yeah, or it's or I want to see the profile and not the deck or something like that. You know, like I, mm -hmm. I for yeah, yeah. So the thing, the thing that I am, um, yeah, the. This is actually a bit of a struggle for me, but there are properties of each of these things in the inventory uh, that are hidden in uh, that are hidden, right? Like if you if you have um, if you have uh, like if you have an app for if you if you have a if you have a caplet, that caplet has a corresponding worker. And it has a corresponding bundle that it or, or or if you have an eval, it's something that was made from an eval. You can look at, you could conceivably look at the program behind it, but there's a, a there's an interplay, a delicate balance <laughs> between um, making those addressable and uh, and also keeping that the those those sub properties private to the creator. So. Um, one thing that I'm entertaining is the idea of an undeniable meta object in all caps that would be something that's like invisible and in and in your inventory that would allow you to interrogate um like for something that I created, what was the worker that was created for free for that thing, or what was the um uh you know, what 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 like what are the properties of the formula? behind this thing if i'm in a position to know if i'm in a position where where i should have a reference to those things without belaboring um without without lit, uh, putting all of those things in your inventory uh, uh directly since they're incidental they, like they need to be discoverable but they do not need to be directly in your inventory um they're there are a number of ways to do that. The first and most obvious is to just say, hey, if you ask for a thing, I'm going, and it needs to have a thing that you didn't express, well, I'm going to add dash worker and dash powers or whatever um, pet names right next to it whenever you create it. And then you can do whatever you want with those things. But those things are deletable. Um and you might not want to be, and you might want want to delete them. Like you should be in a, you should be able to take a list of every worker. For example, if you're the host, you should have access to every worker, regardless of whether you've given them a name, so that you're in a position to kill them, <laughs> basically, or revoke them. Um, just manage them as a resource. So I, I do, I don't yet know what, uh, what I'm going to land, what we are going to land on. For that user experience, it's a tricky problem. Um, the, an, another option for that is to have uh, like a log that says, hey, I created a thing for you. If you want to give it a name, give it a name, and it'll just be in your log forever so that you can find it or any number of other things. Cool. I Thanks am, for, oh, go ahead. One question. I'm curious as to what, what this looks like. Uh, like if you were to send this to me, like, uh, yeah, just interacting. Uh, or like, yeah, I guess discovering this 
like, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to just wrap my head around the ways in which you might be able to make this application like discoverable and then, yeah. Yeah, uh, like at, at, the, at the first level, it's social, right? It's like, hey, Tom, why don't you install oh, the pet, pet demon and uh, and then I will send you an invitation to connect to me and then you, you accept that invitation with your pet demon. And then now you are a, a novice to this thing and I am an expert at this thing up to the point where I can host a game, for example. Then I can just feed you messages so that you can get up and running with that game. Okay, okay. So I just have to trust you. Yeah, and bootstrapping the trust is... Uh, well, that's a really interesting question. That you have to trust me. It depends on what you mean. <laughs> um, the, the idea of this is that you don't have to trust me all that much. If I send you a game, um, you can run that game, and it's safe. It will be safe to run that game, um, even if I am your worst enemy. The it would be a mistake for you to grant that game access to your local resources that you don't want it to have, that you don't want the party who sent it to you to have. Um, but even if you did that, it's, it isn't, it's still limited, right? Uh, the, the app would have to request a communication channel back to the author. It would have to request um, whatever information or capabilities that it's trying to coerce you into giving it. Uh, and you are in a position to deny all of those requests. So, so you, you really have to social engineer me. Yeah. Into it, 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 the idea is that it should be hard to deceive you, but it should also be easy to empower us to have an interesting uh, an interesting experience together, um, without having to like pay a gatekeeper. Cool. I mean, this is really cool. I really enjoyed this. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, this is this was uh, a lot of fun to build. I'm I'll put the link to the um, the Sprightly Projects presentation somewhere easy to find. Um, uh, I and... propose that an easy place to find is the meeting notes for this meeting <laughs> because they are linked from the calendar invitation, and um, it'd be it would be great to to normalize using that as our uh as our log for these kinds of links um uh, cool i'll person. also put them on the draft pr for this demo and a couple other places so we can find them a uh, quick question so is that this in the sprightly demo uh does that use tor in the, the sprightly presentation uh, that I'm referring to is a, a slideshow with um, sketches of what an an app could look like. Okay, My I think I they have implemented a large portion of this, but I haven't seen it. Um, and 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 also to confirm, they my understanding is that they were going to bootstrap off of Tor. Yeah, I'll find uh, the code that I'm referring to and I played around with a little while back. Uh, but yeah, I think it demonstrated a lot of the cool properties that we're trying to get in the end of. Uh, but I definitely had to set up tour and it was the chat was working over tour. Yeah, we, uh, Aaron and I have done some exploration of Tor as a possible way to bootstrap connectivity in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. And of course, bootstrap is the emphasis. It isn't a complete solution. Um, and and we're investigating others. I, I, I've been investigating tail scale as one way to enable peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, for example, the um, and, and had some success with that. Basically, I'm going to try to get to the point where 
I'm going to try as quickly to as quickly I am trying to as quickly as possible get to the point where the pet demon can connect over TCP, bear TCP, TCP as a place to start. Um, having a bear TCP connection is um, a good place to start for also um, forwarding it over Tor. Um, I remember over the a, a little while back that being a hot button issue, and yeah, I still had a lot of gro I still have a lot to grok, but uh, I definitely feel it better. Yeah, I think that Aaron and I have collectively somehow found a way to bootstrap a Tor plugin that does not require the user to separately go off and install Tor. Um, Aaron found a, is it Granix? I think the name of the package it is in is very dusty. <laughs> it was very dusty, but we did manage to get it to point to the point where we could get a tour out of NPM without requiring the user to install it and set it up themselves. Well, and then I went a little bit further and I, I wrote a partial tour client in TypeScript. <laughs> Naturally, yeah, I don't, I don't want to mess around with sprightly goblin tell them and that spending a few hours like playing around with racket uh and i want to avoid that uh just last question that grain package i almost forgot this yeah um so i didn't really dive in there deep but it seems like that's just a wrapper around cap tp but you could you give me a quick Oh, no, no, the grain is an observable store. So you can throw data in there. You can subscribe to a, a data value. Um, and then it has some conveniences for talking over CAPTP or for creating a remote reference for talking over CAPTP. So then you can um, watch state change uh, across the serialization layer. So like on the back end, you know, like the game, the game uh, that I was demonstrating um, <clears throat> is using that to hold its internal state. And so then the UI can subscribe to that state. And when the state changes, the UI can update itself. Okay, cool. Um, so it's not. Um, yeah. I, you know, it's know it's I... like 150 lines or something. It's it's there's not a lot going on. Just that it's storing a value, and you can subscribe to the value change, and then it has an interface that's convenient for working with CapTP. Hey, right. well, I'm sure I won't have any quite. I'm sure that clears everything up for me. <laughs> uh, it's it it is it, it's simple. I I assure you. If you no, yeah, uh, that, read it, that was useful. Uh, and just, and just uh, terms of figuring out like the the, the role it played. So yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. The 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 big. So if you don't have a user interface, it's not su it's not super necessary. Um, but when you have a user user interface, you want to know what the state looks like now. But um, you know, so you need to track. You need to know when the state changes. And that's what these kind of observable stores are useful for. It's, a, it's essentially to help us make reactive user interfaces for state captured in the, uh, like this is, it's an age old question. How do you, how do you sync state between the front end and the back end? Well, with CapTP, it's, it just becomes like where, <laughs> how many ends there are gets a little blurry. <laughs> and so just, there's some state somewhere connected over a network and CapTP is abstracting the entire transport layer of that and all of the multiplexing that you would normally have to do on top of events or whatever. Um, so you can just, here's an object that you can subscribe to and connect the front and back. So like in... Um, Agoric, for example, on the chain does something very similar to connect um on-chain data with dApps um just on my screen real quick on the right hand side we have the game the actual game state is living in a separate process than the ui um, and i'm sending actions to the back end to do something and then i'm subscribed to the state from inside the game and it 
it's saying like the cards in front of this player updated the current uh the player whose turn it is uh changed and so now the this this subscription changed of the cards of the current player and then the log also changed okay so with the gore uh am i right in saying that is it the public uh is the the notifier package would that be uh taking care of this yeah okay the cool. Goric notifier is Ill um so for pet demon to land in endo master we need to move a Goric notifier into the endo repository um Presently, we're using this thing in Daemon called PubSub, but that's just temporary until we get Notifier. And 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 when that day comes, the grains package would be built on top of Notifier. As a, and what is the is the like it, it, what is the blocker for moving Notifier into the Endo directory? Uh, for there... one, one is time. It's mostly mostly willingness to have an engineer work on doing the transfer and um, making sure that we come out the end of that with the new thing being the only thing which is a delicate process um the and then also we may want to trim trim the notifier package back down to the to the bits that we want to maintain for uh, in going forward since mo changing the name of the package is an opportunity to change the API a little bit. We don't want to change it too much because we want to make it easy to migrate. But the notifier package has like two different implementations of notifiers, one of which we regret. So I think that this might be an opportunity to, to drop the regretted one. Um, the other the other factor in play is that at the moment it has become it has become a burden to keep Agoric SDK and the Endo repository in sync. Changes that happen in Endo um, often accidentally break subtle interactions in CI and Agoric SDK. Not all of those things are import are not all of those things are truly breaking changes for end users, but we have over constrained tests, for example, that have to be fixed in concert. Um, and whenever those breakages happen, it adds delays, long, long delays to keeping the two repositories in sync. Um, we are in the midst of a very prolonged attempt to sync Endo with Agoric SDK due to a very long list of incompatibilities that cropped up while we weren't look, looking. Um, and because of that, there's a tension to keep the notifier in Agoric SDK. There's even pressure to move everything in endo into a Goric SDK so that we don't have to deal with the synchronization problem. Um, I'm pushing to keep the endo repository separate. And one of the compromises that's likely to happen in the next few weeks is that we may begin running a Goric SDK canary integration tests in endo PRs. So making it so that endo changes have to be are gated on compatibility with a Goric SDK, which is a compromise but we do need to be able to make progress on these two things concurrently um the is it that, uh, so uh is it much because for moddable the excess engine uh it's uh agoric is uh kind of running that uh how do i say uh, that gets embedded directly in the SDK, right? Rather than it's uh, not Endo. The XSX snap stuff is not in is not entrained by Endo directly or indirectly. In the uh, in the Agoric SDK, uh, I was just wondering about <clears throat> uh, uh, in Agoric SDK has an X snap package which wraps a um which is a javascript wrapper for a native c xs binding the native c binding it's not in the agoric sdk it's entrained as a sub module um but but they they're version pinned anyway yeah i didn't know if there was any similarities between what's going on there and then the... oh yeah yeah there certainly are there certainly are 
And there's one this. I see Salo's question about grains. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to best put it. Um, so is a grain is a grain more like a proxy representation of states from different sources with different ways of them being updated? And you know, it's it's really like an object or sorry, it's a tree of uh particular properties or you know let me um let me say that a single grain corresponds roughly to a javascript property right? right um so if you have a value of an object and we look at the properties of descriptor it has a getter and a setter right yeah yeah so a grain a grain corresponds to a value that can be get or set in addition to get and set it also has observer functions which make it possible to subscribe to subscribe to the changes does that make sense and yeah, and in that sense, could what it gets or sets be um, more than one property, as in an object, like a key value uh, map, or is it uh, just primitive values? So um, I will let Aaron ask about the answer for the concrete it, detail. It, it makes no distinction, um, but it um, a single uh, grain does not you know, if you put an object in there, it's not observing any of its properties or something. It's just when you set a new value, it reports to any subscribers that it changed. Um, but there is, um, you can make a grain map where you can start composing multiple grains into uh, another, you know, into an object grain. And whenever those child properties change, it will update. Um, and then there's some other utilities for like, yeah, I want that grain, that grain, and that grain, and I'm going to use them to compose a value, and it's going to update when any of those child dependency grains update. Right, and and then your um, UI would basically subscribe to the grain and um, know what changes happen. So it's kind of externalizing um, and adding a lot more uh, utility to React State, for instance. Um, yeah, it does integrate with React really well, and um, while Grain doesn't entrain CAPTP, it has a couple of like helper interfaces for it, um, and it allows you to take a remote reference of a Grain without subscribing to it. Um, and if you indicate that that's a Grain map, you can like meaning meaning it's composed of many Grains, um, you can like get the sub grain um so you could you can like hold this object that represents a remote data store and then you can when you want to subscribe to it or subscribe to a sub value of it um mm -hmm. as needed and then unsubscribe so like that's really useful in react if i have i'm suddenly i'm rendering a component i want to subscribe to the value and then when we're destroying the component i just unsubscribe from the value and it's really, you know, it looks like three lines of code in React. And is is the is it one of the intents to make sure that uh, unless you know where the grain, um, is, you know, the, the the value is coming from, the grain itself does not give you that. So it's kind of like an opaque uh, representation. Um, so in a sense, I cannot use a grain to know where the information is coming from. Whatever information yeah. is given to me next to the grain is all I have to work with. Right. That sounds right to me, yeah. Yeah, all right, thanks. Oh, where's the name grain? Where, uh, where is that? Yeah, it's uh, the notion is that one grain is like one atom. You can't really go smaller than that. It's a, it's like one piece of capability that you're handing someone. It's, it's literally the bottom of granularity. Yeah, and, and we're we're uh, I guess adopting that term from uh, Sandstorm. Uh, Sandstorm used the term grain to refer to like one contained element. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. 
uh, new, new uh, terminology. To, uh, I mean, you got to pick a word, and I like that one. No, I think it's a great. I, no, no, I, I think it makes sense. You know, and I didn't, I didn't think that you pulled it out of thin air. That's why I asked. So thank you. Pulled it out of a sandstorm. Very thick air. Yeah, full of grains. <laughs> sandstorm is a. You know, <laughs> got a lot of grains of sand. Um, cool. All right. Well, let's call it. That was a fantastic demo. Um, looking forward to gradually merging bits and pieces of this into into uh, into the demon. And also, I created a playground repository under Endo. I have not yet. I mean, it's an empty repository at this point. I'm. I don't want to push on a particular structure for it but maybe one directory per caplet, for example, would be one way to look at it. And then we can mm -hmm. just use it as a dumping ground for poorly engineered ad hoc. <laughs> Unmaintained. <laughs> Constantly breaking <laughs> caplets. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, well, one thing that's neat about the, the UI for the, the pet name daemon is you don't need to have just one. You can run any of them and as long as they correctly talk to the pet daemon api you can have different ways of looking at the thing yeah uh, go ahead uh yeah sorry about that um I, maybe i was distracted and i wasn't paying attention sorry but did we discuss the subdomains on dev um, oh gosh uh we have in the past not on this call um, we are, thank you for bringing it up. And uh, Aaron, Aaron informed me that you had brought up that the subdomains issue doesn't work in Safari. We also, Aaron also independently discovered that, uh, it doesn't provide the same origin confinement that we need either. So, uh, stay tuned. The, yeah, whatever we, the, the solution we have using localhost subdomains is going to work and to a limited extent for a limited amount of time in order to let us bootstrap, but it is not as confined as it needs to be. Um, could could we explore the idea of having a proxy where you could either have the subdomain or you could have the proxy slash uh, the code, you know, the um, uh, hash? For there the are a whole bunch of online services there are a whole bunch of a lot of a lot of a lot of domains mapped to wildcards on localhost. Um, we could make the pet daemon configurable to the extent that you could decide what your TLD for endo was going to be, and we could also provide like an endo.app domain or something like that. That it it could also be an an app. Like a what am what am I what are they called the what are these packaged browser apps, um, and we wouldn't need to worry about serving on localhost. Yeah, I, they're, I, yeah. So that, far, sorry, Safari uh, gives um, one two seven zero zero one the uh, behavior needed for uh, development. It doesn't give zero 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 zero. Um, and so, so by IP, you can't have a subdomain, um, but you could have a sub uh, route, like a route, basically, as opposed oh, to... Oh, yeah. You could do that, but then you wouldn't have same origin isolation for each of your weblets. You'd basically be able to run one thing at a time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and that one thing at a time, at a time, you would be able to run one a thing. You can't, it would, you'd have to sanitize your local storage etc whenever you transition to something else um yeah right. as aaron mentioned i i was really excited about the local host thing because it made it possible to bootstrap the daemon without having to build out an uh, a shell yeah application those shell applications come with lots of different trade-offs and lots of ways to do them um, I did in January of this year do an extensive study of socket supply co which i think is worth revisiting um, um how, how about docker like a dev container with um you know just just that could be used either in vs code for development and you know gives you um um a linux 
handling of you know URLs. I'm not sure. You still have to have a name. Um, like one one uh, one very one one reason almost reasonable so solution uh is run bind <laughs> run bind locally and like uh, you you could have a bind configuration that just explicitly maps some domain of our choosing to 127001 for all of its and then and then pass through to the underlying internet dns substrate um that would make it possible to have a trustless domain locally um the and as aaron mentioned you could also run an electron app that has and with electron apps you can use um this was this was the first idea was to use an electron app because you can create custom url schemes much like the way extensions run on the web okay. in a web browser you can create a custom you would have like a, a hash a hash domain for um uh, under like the endo colon slash slash protocol um right. that that would be confined it would be confined just as well as a web extension um there are lots and lots of options i'm i'm actually really attracted to leaving this virtual host in place in the pet demon repository if only because it's super easy to get up and running yeah. no, <laughs> even if it's not super super secure yeah i do appreciate that but uh what i'm thinking of is not testing in safari and you know we know safari um is full of surprises so if the development experience makes it hard to test while uh, prototyping in safari um then um maybe an, a different way to test against safari um could be worth exploring yeah yeah one thing i think that we could definitely do for that is a wild card an actual certificate authority based wildcard domain and for development it would be fine assuming that you trust the publisher of the domain which you probably will and, and it would be really easy to set up we could just add an uh, environment variable that the daemon would respect and then it would use that to generate urls yeah yeah that that sounds simple enough configuration wise as long as you have it set up so yeah okay thanks a really long time ago muji offered that he hosts a 12700 wildcard <laughs> i don't remember what it is though it was local dot something we, we could just do that or we could use up one of our domains that we have reserved for endo stuff like i i don't recall whether we registered endo dot app but that would be a reasonable place to put it i think too all right thank you all right cool and now it's a wrap <laughs> see you thanks again